the channel mixer. Basically, it's a module that is designed to allow you to mix the input values of the various color channels of your image file into different outputs of that module. Sounds a bit crazy on the face of it, but let's dive on in and see exactly what it can do for your images. Hi, and welcome to episode 46 of Understanding Darktable. Sorry, it's been a long time between drinks, I know, and I'll explain why at the end. But right now, we're going to dive into the channel mixer. Now, if you've been following this series, you would know that in the last episode, which was all about noise reduction in Darktable 2.6, I spent quite a bit of time looking at the raw denoise module and how we can use that module in combination with the channel mixer to see how much noise is on each of the various color channels, the red, green, and blue channel, within our RAW files. But that's not the only use for the channel mixer. There are other things we can do with it. So I've pulled up the page from the manual that relates to the channel mixer. And as it says, this module is a powerful tool to manage channels. It accepts red, green, and blue as an input, and as output gives you red, green, blue, gray, hue, saturation, and lightness. So we're going to dive into what all of that means. The manual basically goes on to explain how you can use the channel mixer for generating monochrome output. And it even has a table of values for some famous and what were, you know, quite popular black and white film stocks from back in the day when a lot of people were shooting on black and white film. So if you're one of those people who, you know, is old school and you grew up shooting film and you had a particular black and white film emulation that you liked, then you can try manually importing some of these values into the red, green and blue channels and we'll look at how to do that in a sec to recreate the look of those particular black and white film bases how close they get i'm not sure i'm not sure the science that came up with these particular numbers but it's there but black and white is not the only thing we can do with the channel mixer so let's dive on in i've grabbed four random photos from my trip to sri lanka and they these really were just randomly picked and these are images that I have already done some processing on. I've got them to where I want them to be. As you can see, there's not a whole lot of processing going on, uh, but they're pretty much where I want them in order to present them on the web or print them for my photo book or whatever it is that I'm going to do with them. So let's just quickly have a look at these four images. This was an image of a guy shot at a wedding. We, we just happened to gate crash a wedding completely accidentally. Uh, he was, I think, the father of the bride. Uh, there's a shot here from our climb up Sigaria Rock. Uh, then there's one of this lovely little kingfisher that we found on our second last day in Sri Lanka. And there's one of just all the beautiful blue tones of the Maldives. That was just an amazing three days that we spent there. All right, so let's just jump back to this portrait of the father of the bride. Like I said, I've got this image pretty much where I want it right now. What can I do with the channel mixer? Well, as the manual says, we've got all of these seven different destinations or output channels hue saturation lightness red green blue and gray and in the last episode we looked at using the gray channel to help with noise reduction but that's not the only use so if we go to hue what we are about to do is use the channel mixer as a tool for altering the color balance of our image now all of those options there are outputs and our inputs are these three sliders the red green and blue now one thing i've noticed and i don't know if this is a bug or if it's intentional but regardless of the output channel or the destination on the red slider 
if you set this control point to anywhere left of its default value, no change will happen to the image. So if I click here, nothing, click here, nothing, click here, nothing, here, nothing, here, nothing, right? Absolutely, that entire half of the red slider has no impact. Like I said, I suspect it might be a bug, but I don't know for sure. But if we go to positive values, we will immediately see that things start to get weird and they get weird very quickly. And we can basically go to any value right up to a value of two. What I've noticed is that with really low values, just above zero, we can introduce some really interesting color shifts. And it made me think of the thing that they do with film where they'll start out by balancing all of the source footage and then they'll apply a LUT, a lookup table, to apply a certain color grade to all of the footage. And I thought, this kind of works in a similar kind of way in that, you know, you could, you could tweak all of these values and maybe come up with some kind of a, a look that you liked. And if you wanted that look to then be applied to a whole bunch of images, you could just save it as a preset and then apply that preset to all of those images. And I actually did this. I, I went and saved one. I just called it EP46. So it's just a very subtle color grade that gives a lot of reds and muted browns to the image. Now, we don't see a whole lot of change on that particular image because it was pretty close to that in terms of color to begin with. Let's just apply this to this image. See what I mean? Like, you could apply this similar kind of look to all of these images and have a very similar color grade to all of them. Now, whether or not that's useful to you or not, I don't know. But it is just one potential use of the channel mixer. So let's just reset that and let's look at saturation. What we can do is change the saturation of the image using our input sliders. And again, the behavior is not exactly as I thought it would be. Again, with the red channel, if you move the slider anywhere to the left, there is absolutely no desaturation occurring whatsoever. It is only with positive values. I'm just going to start back at zero because I want to show you something. If I right click and go 0.01, which is the smallest increment that we could change, we get a completely desaturated image. Now, I was expecting to only see desaturation of the red channel and for the green and blue channels to still retain the color information. But that's not what's happened. We've got all channels desaturated. I'm not sure if this is intentional. As we increase this value, we start to see color coming back and we can drag this all the way to two and end up with something that looks like a complete and utter horror story. I'm not sure if there's a real world usage for those sorts of levels, but I certainly don't have one. So we'll hit reset and we'll go to the green channel. Again, negative values do something just like positive values do something. And reset and it's the same with the blue channel. We can get effects happening with negative values as well as positive values. Now, like I said, I'm not sure if it's intentional that desaturation happens to all channels at the same time. I would have expected to be able to just desaturate the red channel or the green channel or the blue channel, but that is not what appears to be happening. So let's move on. Lightness. Again, some weirdness. Left-hand side of the red channel does nothing. If we set a value of 0.01, we've got an image that is almost entirely black. And as we move to the right, we introduce lightness back into our image and we can actually drive that to extremes. Again, with the green channel, 
things happen on the left-hand side of the slider as they do on the right-hand side of the slider. What I find interesting, though, is if we set this to zero and we then go minus 0.01, we immediately go from our base image to almost pure black. Now, what I find interesting is that if I grab this slider and start moving to the left, which you would expect to make the image darker, we will actually see the green parts of the information in the histogram moving to the right, which suggests that they're getting brighter. I'm not sure if that's really what's happening. See, we can see as I drag left, the green values and the blue values are moving to the right. And we don't appear to be introducing more lightness other than this little highlight here. I don't know exactly what's going on there. And with positive values, we can again start to introduce lightness back into the image. Let's reset that. And the same sort of thing, as you would expect, happens with the blue channel. Move it just a little bit to the left, we get a completely black image. As we move it further to the left, almost no change. Come past zero, and we then get our image starting to fade into view from very dark to very light. So how you would use this in the real world, I'm not entirely sure. The help manual doesn't go into any further detail on how to use the channel mixer beyond using it for monochrome mixes as mentioned previously. So we'll reset this. We'll then move on to the red channel. Now, as you can see, when you choose one of the color channels as an output, the input of the same value will be set to a value of one. So when red is the output channel, the red input channel has a value of one and the other two have a value of zero. And if we go to the green, the green channel has a value of one at the input, while red and blue are at zero. If we go to the blue channel, same again, the blue channel input is at one and the other two are at zero. So does this mean that we can mix a little bit of the green and the blue into the red channel output? Well, that's kind of what I expected, but it's not what appears to be going on. What does seem to be the case here is that this slider allows us to adjust the contrast of this particular channel at the input stage. So if we drag it to values lower than one, we can see the contrast of the red channel, if you watch the histogram, is getting smaller, right? We've got reds all the way down to almost black, but we've now limited how far up the histogram they extend. And as we drag that to the right, we are expanding the contrast of that red channel. So it seems to me that this could be used as a very handy tool for working with images that color-wise are completely out of whack. Actually, that gives me an idea. Let me go and find an image that I, I'm thinking of. I'll be back in a sec. Okay, I'm back. This image, as you can see, is an absolute shocker. It is a photograph of a 45-year-old photographic print. The inks in the original print have degenerated with age obviously left us with this massive orange color cast it looks like there's not a whole lot of blue and green information in the image now and i thought based on what i was saying a minute or so back that the channel mixer might have done a decent job of recovering this in the few minutes that i was not recording i did some testing and i have to say the results were less than inspiring I've actually had a better result on previous attempts at not only correcting this image, but other images like it with the color correction module. It actually does a better job than the channel mixer. But just for comparison, we'll very quickly have a look at it. So we'll go to the red channel. We'll give the red slider a tweak just so that we can see where the red information is in our histogram. And as we can see, 
the red information is actually quite narrow on the histogram. We really need to be able to stretch the red information out so that it doesn't just encapsulate that 25% to 75% range on the histogram. We need it to spread the full width. And that's why I say I don't think the channel mixer is perhaps the best tool for the job. So we'll move on to the green channel, do the same thing. We will spread that out across the middle of the histogram. Again, it doesn't stretch the full width like it should. And we'll go to the blue channel. And we can actually see here that the blue information does stretch across the full width of the histogram, but we still don't end up with a nicely color balanced image. Like I said, I've had better results with the color correction module. So I'm not going to spend any more time trying to recover that image. It's obviously a bit of a problem image anyway. All right, I am going to leave it there for now. Uh, a couple of things that I wanted to talk about. Obviously, ah, oh, Sri Lanka, amazing. Maldives, amazing. Just had the best time. Uh, came home with couple of thousand images, which, you know, because I'm, I'm a fairly conservative shooter, I think. Uh, so 2,000 images for, well, 21 days, so about 100 images a day, give or take. And out of that, I've cropped it down to about 250 that I'll use for my photo book. So, uh, yeah, really enjoyed the trip, had a great time, beautiful people, great food, Mm, random on the weather front we we copped a fair bit of rain in the interior uh places like ella and candy we we copped a fair bit of rain um but it was it was a great trip absolutely awesome trip i do want to address the fact that i have been home for three weeks and i am only just now getting to sit down and produce another video for you guys and the reason for that is because i I don't know if I've mentioned this. Uh, you, you know that I'm an audio engineer by trade. That's what I do. I was retrenched from a full-time position two years ago. And in those two years, I've largely been relying on freelance work. And freelance work that I had ran out the day before we flew to Sri Lanka. And I knew that before we flew out, that it was coming to an end. I was, obviously more so than I should have been, confident that it was going to resume when I got back, and it hasn't. Uh, so I've had a further three weeks of unplanned holiday uh, where I've been here at home and basically devoting all of my time to looking for work. Uh, and everyone I've spoken to has said that the industry is really quiet and, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people I've spoken to have said, mate, if we were going to use freelancers, you would be the guy we call. But we're just not using anyone right now because, you know, when someone goes on leave, other people within the team just have to pick up the slack and, you know, various versions of stories like that. So, yeah, so it's been a little bit, bit of a mental struggle, uh, you know, looking for work. And uh, so... Yeah, there's a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Nothing that I want to talk about just yet because don't want to jinx it. But uh, hopefully I will now be able to get back into a regular pattern of cranking out some new videos for you guys. On the subject of Darktable, if you have signed up to either the Darktable user or Darktable dev mailing lists, you would all be already be familiar with the fact that the next version of Darktable, which will drop at Christmas time, is not going to be 2.8, it's actually going to be 3.0. The developers have decided in their wisdom that there is so much new stuff coming that uh, it warrants a bump in version number up to 3, which is pretty exciting to hear. Um, as a consequence, I have finally taken the dive and got myself onto the development version of Darktable 2.7. Uh, I've not had much time to spend on it at this point in time um, because of the aforementioned job searching 
things that I've been doing. But it is on my schedule to spend a bit more time with 2.7, try and get up to speed on the new features that are in it so that the moment 3.0 drops at Christmas time, I'll be able to get a video out pretty much straight away with all of the new features, you know, covered and highlighted and explained. That's the plan anyway. On top of that, I've done what I said I wasn't going to do, which is put my hand up to help with the editing of the documentation for 3.0. Uh, something that came up on the email list was the fact that um, in the past, new versions of Darktable have dropped, but the documentation hasn't been ready at the same time. And it's been, you know, another month or two before the documentation got updated. And obviously that's not ideal, particularly for new users. I mean, it's hard enough even for, you know, people like you and I who, who have spent some time with Darktable and who know it already, just trying to work out what new features do. But for a new user, if there's no documentation to outline what these new features are, then that becomes a bit of a stumbling block. So something we're trying to work on between now and Christmas is to make sure that the documentation for three is really up to date and ready to go out the door along with the software on Boxing Day or Christmas Eve, whichever day it is that, that, that it drops. So yeah, that's kind of the latest at this point in time. Um, yeah, I don't think I've got anything more to add. Uh, any questions, comments, feedback, please sing out via the comments down below. And I'll catch you in the next one.